Major funding for California Heartland provided by... I like being a farmer. It's hard work, but we love it. It's a great feeling knowing that you're helping to feed and clothe the world. Farm Bureau, dedicated to a better California. Cal Farm Insurance, your neighbors and friends. A company deeply rooted in California. Your choice for business, farm, personal, and health insurance. Cal Farm Insurance Company. California Heartland is proudly supported by Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Coming up, a holiday profile of Secretary of Food and Agriculture, Ann Veneman, who gives California Heartland a cook's tour and brings us up to date on agriculture in our state. We'll offer some tips on food safety, a Christmas partnership of chestnuts and mistletoe, and a Kevin Starr essay. That and more next on this holiday edition of California Heartland. Welcome, I'm George Redding. Thanks for joining us for this Christmas edition of California Heartland. Santa isn't the only one who has a tough time keeping track of goings on this time of year. California Secretary of Food and Agriculture has no easy job any time of the year. She's Ann Veneman, and Pat McConaughey found this versatile member of the governor's cabinet where many of us are this time of year, in the kitchen. Politics and agriculture and, and what are we seeing? As my background, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> You seldom find her in such a relaxed setting. That's because Ann Veneman has a high-pressure, high-profile job, heading up the California Department of Food and Agriculture. I uh, grew up on a farm in Modesto, California, and some of my strongest memories as a child are of, you know, following my dad around in the peach orchard. Ann's father, John Veneman, was a farmer and active in state and national politics. Ann followed in his political footsteps. She became the number two person in the U.S. Department of Agriculture during the Bush administration and remains the highest ranking woman ever in the USDA. Today, Ann travels the world promoting California's agricultural bounty. The latest marketing campaign is called, appropriately, California Taste the Sunshine. People have generally both here and abroad a very positive image of California and so the idea is is to get some way to associate food with California and what better way to showcase California foods than to have Ann play uh, guest more, chef at uh, my house near Sacramento a chance for her to fix a favorite holiday dish and a friend of mine, actually, who is now the Secretary of Agriculture in Kansas, brought this over. How funny. <laughs> and, um, and what this is, is a tenderloin of beef with a black pepper crust. Simply delicious. And you take a little of the olive oil and you rub it on the, the meat itself. And then you simply take a cracked pepper. Basically, just work the pepper into the meat itself. Boy, that's what I like, those so it, good recipes that are simple. It's very simple. <laughs> Besides the beef, our feast included a cornucopia of other California products. After all, we have greater diversity of product than almost anywhere in the world. We grow over 350 different crops and commodities. We've got lettuce. We've got endive, and we've got radicchio. I made the salad while my husband and daughter set the table, but Anne contributed the lion's share of the meal, locally grown brown and wild rice, and... A blend of mushrooms, it's called mushroom ragu, and then we have a carrot dish in a, in a ginger sauce. Anne, as you can imagine, is a very busy woman. She didn't have dinner with us just for her health, as the saying goes, but for yours, for mine, for all of ours. We'd like to have a toast to the happy holiday season. To ensure a happy, healthy holiday season, Ann's department has launched a food safety campaign because most foodborne illness doesn't come from the farm but originates in the home. To top off the meal, we thought we'd pass up the gooey dessert and serve up a big helping of food safety tips. At the top of the list, basic cleanliness. Make sure that there are clean surfaces because cross-contamination is one of the uh, biggest areas where we see food safety problems. 
Wash cutting boards with soap and hot water after each use. That's especially important if you go from preparing meat to vegetables on the same surface. After washing, wipe boards dry with clean paper towels. Keep your hands and cooking utensils well scrubbed. And be sure to go to the California Heartland website for all the CDFA food safety tips, plus recipes. Happy holidays! For California Heartland, I'm Pat McConaughey. Still to come, a stocking stuffer you probably hadn't thought of. Fruit fit for kings and presidents. And dairymen in the Heartland extend a helping hand in the fight against starvation. But next, a report on a couple of meaningful holiday items. Products as important to the tradition of the holidays as the Christmas tree or tinsel. I'm talking about chestnuts and mistletoe, two seasonal stalwarts with roots deep in mythology and ancient history. It's a familiar sight on the frosty streets of London, but not so in California. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. It's pretty good sized nuts. Compared to big producers in Europe and Asia, the California chestnut crop is puny. A mere 130 or so acres in commercial production. Some of those belong to Tim Bowden, a farmer in the foothills above Sacramento. Chestnuts really aren't nuts at all. They're a type of grain that grows on trees inside spiny pods. There's usually um, two or three nuts inside the pod, so they grow next to each other. When they mature, the pods fall to the ground, where they're opened with a stomp of the foot. You can eat them raw, and they taste great, but they're really hard to peel. So, Tim says, cook them. It's easy. You can cut the cap off, and then when you roast it, this will tend to slide out of the shell. Actually, a lot of these will pop right out of the, the shell. Before roasting, drop the chestnuts into boiling water to prevent them from drying out. Drain the water, then roast the nuts on a high fire. Chestnuts make a guilt-free food, remarkably low in fat and calories. For at least one holiday meal, you might want to forego the chocolates and reach instead for the chestnuts. Another holiday tradition that grows on trees, the lowly mistletoe. It's just a parasite that attacks mostly oak trees. You can find it on pine trees, and it just lives off the oak tree until it kills it. You move it back and forth, like so. And James Fleet and Mike Hibbard harvest the stuff before the worst damage is done. How about that one? It's nice and green. Thank you. A lot of mistletoe ends up for sale at places like Indian Rock Tree Farm near Placerville where Larry Heider shares its mystery and lore. Mistletoe is a symbol of love. If a couple was to kiss under the mistletoe, t'was a promise that they were going to marry and live happily ever after. So if you'd like to eat, drink, and possibly be married this holiday season, plant yourself under the mistletoe. Who knows what might happen? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. And if you're nuts over chestnuts, I promise you, you can get a bushel of information on our website. You'll find us at the web address www.californiaheartland.org. We'll have a couple of chestnut recipes as well. One of the most challenging aspects of Christmas shopping, I'm sure you'll agree, is searching for just the right stocking stuffer. Nothing is impossible here in the heartland, however. What about loofah? Yeah, loofah. Just one of the many small gifts that could be just right for an important person on your list. At Christmas time, there's no telling what you'll find in your stocking because there are so many different types of stocking stuffers. But there's one item that's in a class all its own, the loofah. It's used as a body scrub, but where does it come from? Loofahs are actually a fruit and a member of the gourd family. They may look like an ocean sponge or sea animal, but they're not, so you won't find them here. Instead, loofahs grow on a vine. They thrive in warm areas and grow up to 15 inches long. But it's the inside of this plant that really counts. Once it dries back, all the insides will, will just collapse and disappear. And then all you have left is this, this sponge part. And it's this inner sponge or natural fiber that is making a splash in the world of health and beauty. Lufas um, are used to exfoliate the dead uh, skin 
cells off the top layer of the skin. Um, they can also be used to increase uh, circulation. Also, it can be used for um, reducing the appearance of cellulite. So does that mean loofahs are strictly for scrubbing? Not quite. Just ask Eleanor Dong, who grows loofahs at a community garden in Fair Oaks. But the Chinese people like to eat the... Uh, eat it at around this size, and they either saute it or put it in uh, uh, soups. Young loofahs taste similar to summer squash, and they remain a tradition among Asian families. But loofahs also remain a popular item for pure indulgence, and a stocking stuffer unlike any other. For California Heartland, I'm Allison Thompson. Loofahs are not just for scrubbing your skin. You can also use them to clean fruits vegetables, even china and silverware. But there is an important tip to keep in mind. Loofahs are prone to mildew, so they need to be replaced every few months. If you'd like to know how to grow your own loofah, check out our website at www.californiaheartland.org. Now, as you probably know, there are no references to, to the three kings delivering fruit to the manger on that first Christmas. But then perhaps it just wasn't available. There is an El Dorado County man who delivers his fruit to kings and presidents. The secret to his success is all in the timing. We're extremely concerned with flavor uh, and taste in, in the fruit we produce here. Now, we let our fruit hang quite a bit longer than most commercial operations do. Uh, actually, I think we, we, we say we pick the fruit just before it falls. And so you know that it's very, very ripe. And that's the key thing. And that is what separates Ron Mansfield from most other fruit growers. The willingness to gamble and allow each fruit to reach full flavor maturity before picking. These guys all understand how important it is to our markets, to our customers, to get uniformly ripe cherries. So they put in a lot of extra effort. And we may pick a little bit slower than some crews. We're not paid by the container or by volume. We're our, we're, our crews are paid by the hour. We want quality. That's all we're going for is quality here. It's very seldom you see this type of color in the, in the marketplace. But that's a real solid indicator of maturity. And you're going to have tremendous flavor here in this, this type of fruit. Mmm. Great flavor. Never get tired of a really ripe cherry. Mmm. It's a shame when we get to the end of the harvest season and run out. But here at Mansfield's Gold Bud Ranch, the beat goes on. After cherries come plums, peaches, and nectarines, followed by super sweet Fuji apples, pears, and grapes. All are picked with the same careful attention. Como están la fruta? The attention to color, texture, size, and taste has paid off for Mansfield. His fruit is in big demand. Between June and March, he will ship out about 900 tons. Half of his fruit is sold to the Bay Area. The remainder is overnighted throughout the country, but not just to any buyer. We're very selective about the people we choose to distribute our product. They must fully understand the product they're receiving. Our product is so much riper than uh, what uh, fruit is usually shipped uh, the distances to the East Coast. And if someone is expecting to be able to hold this fruit and store it for three or four or five days, it's, it's not going to last. David Berkeley Specialty Food Company in Sacramento has sold Mansfield's fruit for 10 years. Among his clients, the past three presidents. Last year, uh, George Bush himself called. And you know what that was like to take the call and say, oh, this is George Bush. Uh, I'm waiting to talk to David Berkeley. And he had just received his shipment of O. Henry peaches and they were so delicious, this was at Kenny Bunkport, that he uh, had, he said, you know, David, I usually drop you a note, but he said, I just felt like I'm gonna call you. I just had one of these O. Henry's and they're so fabulous that I just felt like I had to call you and tell you. The payback for me, not only in the price we get for the product, is the compliment that, that I get on my product and the compliment that I can share with my people in my operation so that we all feel real satisfied that we've done a tremendous job. <laughs> you know, this old wood-burning stove of the Roaring Twenties saw a lot of bread baking. Recently, we discovered a different twist in the art of baking the staff of life. In East Hollywood, there is a baker who turns a common loaf of bread 
into an unusual loaf of bread by simply using an array of California herbs and produce. His creations are proving to be a big hit at farmers markets throughout Southern California. Here's Pat. Well, it's a given that any bakery is going to smell good. There's no way around it. But there's something different about the scents that are wafting through Jack Bijan's bakery here in East Hollywood. And the secret is in the herbs. Jack works with more than 30 different herbs in creating his various breads and rolls. Herbs that he either buys at the farmer's market or grows himself. And one of his favorites is spearmint. Since my grandmother used to make soups with um, feta or yogurt, I decided maybe spearmint would be great in the bread. Creating that perfect taste is a matter of trial and error. And where does he get many of his fresh ingredients? California oranges, orange peel, uh, California olives, uh, and, um, and thyme, California thyme. The Armenian Bijan is more than a baker. He's an experimentalist. After trying all types of yeast cultures, he settled on the French Levan method, which means self-rising. You cannot use um, baking soda, baking powder, any other leaveners along with the natural culture. He lets the dough ferment for several days. That allows it to rise slowly in a cool environment. He uses no shortening or oil, but the results are worth it. Jack, what all is in this bread? It's very colorful. <laughs> this is the green olive that we do. It's got green olive, California walnuts, <laughs> California watercress. The breads are works of art, each sliced with a different letter of the alphabet on top. That's so Bijan can tell them apart. Have the small garlic and cilantro, please. After feverishly baking more than a thousand loaves all morning, you'll most likely find Bijan at one of several Southern California farmers markets, selling his labors of love to a very satisfied public. Oh, everything I bought from here was so wonderful. <laughs> and maybe those titles sound a little strange, but every combination was so good. When was the last time you picked up a loaf of garlic cilantro bread or tarragon and parmesan at the supermarket? The line on Bijan's t-shirt says it all. And you thought I was not adventurous? No, Jack, of course not. These guys have the best bread in town. Absolutely. Far none. For California Heartland, I'm Pat McConaughey. A newsletter headlining the Bejan Bakery is in the works. To find out more about what they're cooking up at the bakery, you can call area code 818-242-9204 or email glendale19 at earthlink.net. For those of us who are blessed to live in the heartland and are sustained by what it provides, the issue of global hunger can often go unnoticed. But it's hard not to notice when an entire country is under the stranglehold of starvation. One heartland dairy farmer has taken notice of the plight of a starving nation a world away and is taking steps to help in the only way he knows how. Meet John Zupin. He's a dairy farmer in the North Sacramento Valley who's devoted the past 40 years to California's dairy industry. But lately, his thoughts are thousands of miles away. John is focused on the plight of millions of people on the verge of starvation in North Korea. For the last two years, severe flooding has damaged crops and forced thousands from their homes. These disasters worsened an already troubled economy and food situation in this communist country. John first learned of the famine on a recent television documentary. They were taking wood chips and making a soup out of them to feed the kids and keep the kids alive in North Korea. And at that time, I just sat there and I just couldn't believe it. But he didn't sit still for long. John immediately started going door to door, asking other dairy farmers to donate 1% of their daily production for one month. To his surprise and delight, he found 58 dairy farmers willing to participate. We're hoping to get a container load, which is 37,000 pounds of pow whole milk powder. I guess they give from the heart. Phil Lewis is one of those dairy farmers who's giving from the heart, but it wasn't an easy decision to make. Probably the past seven, eight months, the price of milk has been dropping quite a bit, and the price of feed is high, and we're all feeling it in our pocketbooks, and that. But then when you start thinking of the children eating soup, wood chips, you know, it just touches a person. Hey, you guys go ahead and finish spraying. Frank Gonzalez is also feeling a strain in his pocketbook, but he feels strongly that something must be done. 
My family dates back to the early 20s in dairy business in California, and I just feel that part of our life is to produce food to feed other people. I guess it's just because you feel that if you can help others, maybe in return, things will come better for you. They already made the deal, the price and everything. Together, these dairy farmers, along with dozens of others, are working tirelessly to feed the people of North Korea. But it couldn't be done without the support of local companies like Dairy America and Land O'Lakes. Once we know the total amount of milk that's involved, we'll go out and purchase the amount of whole milk powder that would actually make and also facilitate the transportation of that to Korea via the Catholic uh, Relief Services. So after months of hard work, John is finally seeing his perseverance pay off. Shipments of powdered milk will soon be on their way to North Korea. And although it's been a long road, John says if he had to do it all over again, he would. I guess I was just uh, determined to do it, and, and so I never really thought of it uh, that yeah, maybe I was saving a life, you know. But I think the real heroes are the dairymen because they're the ones that are given. The shipment of powdered milk was due to arrive in North Korea just over a week ago. The final count weighed in at 37,000 pounds. It'll be delivered to 65 nurseries, serve 7,000 children at 50 grams a day for 30 days. State librarian Kevin Starr is on hand this week to offer some thoughts on the wealth and generosity in the heartland, its winter mask, and its spiritual essence during this holiday season. I have been asked today at the beginning of this winter season to speak about winter farming and ranching in the California heartland. By March 1874, the Pacific Rural Press, the most important publication covering rural life and the heartland in this period, having taken stock of the continuing winter, admitted to its readers that, yes, the heartland had its winters, and for the rancher, farmer, and stockman, these winters could be more than a little difficult. In the foothills, for example, sudden winter snowstorms were especially problematic. Even if there were feed on hand, cattle sometimes got isolated and lost. Freak snowstorms, moreover, dropping more than four feet of snow could come as late as the end of March and wreck havoc on the calving season. Late winter storms could also wreck havoc on fruit and alfalfa crops. Bonfires were lit or in the citrus groves of the southern San Joaquin, smoke pots were set out and for days it would be touch and go whether or not the late and lingering winter would damage the spring crop. Ranching or farming the heartland, even after the coming of the big machines, was not for the faint of heart, especially in winter. Here, after all, was an agricultural empire seized from nature by the rapacity of the gang plow and the systematic irrigation. Yes, the heartland has been invented by man's technology, but it has also been loved by man, humanized by man, in fact, across more than 100 years of a frequently tumultuous relationship. The holiday season means so much in the heartland because it asserts, like agriculture itself, that even in the struggles of winter, there are healing connections with earth and sky and moments of peace in the midst of winter stillness as the great religious traditions of the world discover that they too are sinking deep roots into the soil of the heartland. Passing down through the summer dust and the winter mud, anchoring themselves in the very bedrock. Stillness and quietude, the celebration of Hebrew deliverance and Christian incarnation. Now the heartland comes into its own, blessed by grace and love, bathed in winter light. Our time has run out for this edition of California Heartland. Here's what we have in store for our next program. Oh, Doing our bidding at a world-renowned wine auction. Doing dairy differently with sheep cheese. We're all at sea in search of swordfish and preserving the relics of agriculture at the Hydric Ag Museum. That and more next week. Be sure to log on to our website at www.californiaheartland.org. Your comments and story ideas are welcome. You can also email us at calhart at kvie.org 
or drop us a note at California Heartland, Box 6, Sacramento 95812. I'm George Redding, and for everyone on the staff of California Heartland, season's greetings. Have a safe holiday, and be sure to join us again next week down on the farm. To order a copy of this broadcast, send a check for $15 plus local sales tax to California Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom, Post Office Box 15949, Sacramento, California, 95853. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery. Statewide communications supported by the Almond Board of California and the California Beef Council. Major funding for California Heartland provided by... I like being a farmer. It's hard work, but we love it. It's a great feeling knowing that you're helping to feed and clothe the world. Farm Bureau, dedicated to a better California. Cal Farm Insurance, your neighbors and friends. A company deeply rooted in California. Your choice for business, farm, personal, and health insurance. Cal Farm Insurance Company. California Heartland is proudly supported by Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Come celebrate the holidays with California Heartland. Hello, I'm George Redding. Join me for the next edition of California Heartland as we go into the kitchen with Ann Veneman, California Secretary of Food and Agriculture. Then, a kiss and tell story about the mysterious mistletoe. And visit a unique LA bakery with a delicious California twist. Join me for the next edition of California Heartland.